So I'm going to talk about um, uh, Adam, Eve, and the Gospel. And this is that app, okay? I, I put this up there so you can see the app. It's called the Searstone app, or they go to the searstone.com and you can download the app. And it's again, it's being, it's in the process of being worked on. It just went live on, bo on the, all the app stores about a week ago. And so they're working the bugs out. There are always going to be bugs, and they're working the bugs out. But I have had them put up already all of the PowerPoints that I'm going to do on this cruise. They're already on that app. The audio is coming behind it, and then the video will be behind it also as soon, as soon you know, shortly after. We well, get this is going to be talking about Adam and Eve in the Gospel. There's a lot of uh, traditions, in my opinion, false traditions, opinions, and interpretations when it comes to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But I want to go through the scriptures and start talking about some of these things that we sometimes have misconceptions of. Uh, there's traditions out there that we have just accepted over years and actually generations. Uh, that aren't necessarily congruent with the scriptures or doctrine that's found in the scriptures. And so I want to go over a few of these things. Um, and so we're going to talk about this to begin with. We've often said there's two conflicting commandments uh, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and that because of those two conflicting commandments, we have to justify, because we think they're conflicting, we have to justify why God would give us two conflicting commandments, which leads to a lot of issues and problems down the road because once you make one wrong assumption then another one's going to be wrong and then another one and so we think that there's two conflicting commandments the first one first commandment is not to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and that was a commandment so if, if you want to call it a commandment I'm not sure whether you can have an actual commandment if you don't know good from evil uh, but Adam is told that of any tree he can freely eat except the tree of knowledge of good and evil uh, and that, remember, God forbids it, and in the day thou partakest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So that's one of the commandments. Um, the second one is to multiply and replenish the earth. But when you actually get into the scriptures, there's no commandment in the scriptures to multiply and replenish the earth until you get to Noah. God as it says in chapter 1 of Genesis or chapter 2 of Moses, it says, and God, in the context of creation, and God said unto them, no, God blessed them, it says, God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue the earth, and have dominion over every living thing. But that's not given as a commandment. That's given as a con in the context of creation. Abraham puts it completely different. At the time of their creation, which is the corresponding verses in Abraham, it says God caused them to be fruitful. He put it in them. They have that ability. They have that potential. And I'll show you how that works as we go on. But the, the first commandment we see to multiply and replenish the earth in scriptures really shows up with, with Noah after everybody's gone. So... Uh, but the others that we have in Moses and that we have in Abraham as well as in Genesis is, is, really, to, uh, is really an aspect of creation and the potentials that they are given at the time of creation. Okay? Now, since we're just a small group and we're here just for fun, <clears throat> if you've got questions, don't be afraid to raise them. Don't, there's no such thing as a dumb answer or question. There might be a dumb answer if it's coming from me, but there's no such thing as a dumb question. So don't be afraid to ask questions. And if you've got the question, somebody else has it too. The smart questions are always the ones that are asked. Well, to rationalize the two conflicting commandments theory, it's been taught in the church that Adam and Eve understood and knew the gospel plan and the plan of salvation before the fall. That's how we rationalize it. Often we'll say that, well, Adam wasn't quite on the ball and he wanted to get things rolling and so she... Uh, kind of changed the menu plan for dinner and got Adam to partake of that fruit that she knew what she wanted and she was she had a great desire to have children and so she wanted the plan of salvation to get going and so she partook of the fruit that's not what it says and you have to let scripture speak for itself let Adam and Eve speak for themselves you got to forget about opinions, traditions, and interpretations and let the scriptures speak for themselves. And so it's been taught that Adam and Eve understood the gospel before the fall. There is no gospel before the fall. There is no savior before the fall. If, if 
they partake of, a, of the fruit, then a savior will be provided. There is no gospel until there's a fall. There's no gospel, there's no savior until there's a need for that. If they partake of the fruit, then a savior will be provided. Well, what, why did Adam fall? Let me throw the question out there. Why did Adam fall? Okay. That was Eve's argument. <laughs> Without question. I mean, I'm, who am I to argue with that? You know, that statement. <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> Did Adam know all of this? Probably not. Well, that, that's what I'm. That's what. That's why I want you, want you to think. What? Why did Adam choose to partake of the fruit and fall, Brother Thompson? He wanted to stay with her. That's exactly right. Listen, listen to what the scriptures say, and let the scriptures speak for themselves. And I, the Lord God, said unto Adam, Who told thee that thou wast naked? When he when he says, Adam, where art thou? He knew God knew where he was, and he knew what he he knew, he knew what he had done. No pun intended there. <coughs> <coughs> and he questioned him, "Hast thou eaten of the tree wherewith uh, whereof I have commanded that thou should not eat? <coughs> if so, thou should surely die." Well, here's Adam's answer. Adam gives the reason why he partook of the fruit, why he did it, and he says, according to Scripture. And the man said, The woman thou gavest me, and commanded she should remain with me. She gave me of the fruit, and I did eat. So Adam, and we've all heard this, Adam first blames God, the woman you gave me. And then you commanded she should remain with me. She gave me, and I did eat. So he passes the buck a little bit. Now, I don't think it was that way, but Adam is just saying, this is the reason he's answering the question, why did you partake of the fruit? And Adam's answering the question, this is the reason I partook of the fruit, because the woman you gave me and commanded that I was supposed to stay with her gave me of that fruit and I did eat, because she had eaten it and was going to be cast out. Adam wasn't going to eat it. He said no. She partakes of it. Now she's going to get cast out, and Adam says, I'm supposed to stay with her. I'm supposed to stay with her. So Adam's fall wasn't an issue. It was, uh, Adam's fall was an issue of eternal marriage, not an issue of posterity, or nor an issue of making the gospel plan go forward. Eternal marriage is required for exaltation, not children. So the issue of the fall with Adam was that that of staying or remaining with that spouse, with Eve. That's what he says. Now you can say anything you want, and I can't argue with your opinions, but the scripture says that Adam says that it's because he's supposed to remain with the woman. That's why he partook when questioned by God. We learn in the scriptures there in Moses 3, And the rib which I, the Lord God, had taken from Adam, made I woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This I know is bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And we learn this there at the end of Moses chapter 3 as it goes on. And it says, Therefore shall, and this is where the Lord starts talking. The first was Adam speaking. Now this is where the Lord starts speaking. And he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and cleave unto his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. So he says, when a man gets married, he, he, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and her family and her friends. <laughs> I don't know whether you've noticed, but a man will live closer to his in-laws than he does his own family. And we learn through scripture that a man, and this was the warning to David and to Solomon and many others, a man worships the God of his wife. And so a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And so that's what's being said here in a roundabout way. And the twain shall be one flesh. And now here it's coming down to answer one of those two conflicting commandments. And they were both naked and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Now what does that mean? They were both naked and not ashamed. What's that? 
Okay. Can you hear me if I step away from that? In the back, you can't. Boy, now I'm now I can sing. <laughs> okay. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Say it again. You said it. They didn't have anything. Any, yeah. Did they have the potential? They had the potential, just like a child has the potential for posterity, but they didn't have the the sexuality. They didn't have the sexuality. Go ahead. Right, exactly. They had the potential, they had the ability by the fact that they were created. That's why Abraham says, and God caused them, is speaking of the creation, which is the corresponding verses in Moses. God speaking of the creation of Adam and Eve says, He caused them that they would be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Cause them to have the potential to subdue the earth and cause them to have the ability to have dominion over every living thing. That's an aspect. That whole, that what we think is a command is an aspect of creation. And so they could be created with the potential. But they're not ashamed because they don't have the sexuality. And without that, they didn't partake of the fruit to have children. Are you understanding? In 2 Nephi we read, And they would have no children, wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence. If they had partaken, and speaking, if they had partaken of the tree of knowledge of good, or the tree of life after that, they would have remained in a state without children, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Sending children of misery? <laughs> to some it would. Your children no misery? Yep. <laughs> it works both ways. You know, that's what they say about the sacrifice of Isaac and Abraham. We know that... We know that Isaac was an older, and it says that in Hebrew. It uses the Hebrew word bahor for the age of Isaac, and that means a, a young man, usually between 20 and 30 years old. And therefore, the sacrifice of Isaac was a sacrifice, because had he been a teenager, it wouldn't have been a sacrifice. <laughs> so, you realize when... Before Eve was created, the Garden of Eden and mankind was perfect. Completely perfect. Adam was perfect in every way. He couldn't fold the towels the wrong way. He couldn't put the toilet paper up <laughs> backwards. He could eat what he wanted. He was perfect. And that's why it's not good that man should be alone because somebody needs to tell him when he's not perfect. But before. <laughs> But before the creation of Eve, he couldn't do anything wrong. <laughs> Nothing, so. But anyway, the Book of Mormon tells us they would have remained in a state of innocence. Now, if they partake of the fruit, and we just mentioned this, and it's a familiar phrase, if they partake of the fruit, then a Savior will be provided because there's no need of a gospel before the fall. So when did Adam and Eve get the gospel then? There's arguments all the time. Well, they had it in the Garden of Eden. They, got, they understood the gospel in the Garden of Eden. Well, there's no gospel. There's no Savior. There's no need for a Savior prior to the fall. Go ahead. Yes. And we're going to talk about that. Yes, look at this. When did Adam and Eve get the gospel? And it came to pass. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, chapter 5 of, of Moses. And it came to pass that, af that after I, the Lord God, had driven them out, this is after they're out, Adam began to till the earth and to have dominion over all the beasts of the field. Now remember, Adam in that blessing is given, he says, God caused them, God blessed them and caused them to be fruitful, to subdue the earth and have dominion over every living thing. They, could, they had those potentials in the Garden of Eden, but we don't see those potentials taking, taking effect 
or becoming a reality until after they're driven out, driven out. And that's why it says here in verse 1, Adam began to till the earth. That's to subdue the earth. And then he began to have dominion over every living thing and to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow as I the Lord commanded him. And his wife Eve did labor with him. And Adam knew his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters. And they began to multiply and replenish the earth. And from that time forth, the sons and daughters of Adam began to divide two and two in the land and to till the land into ten flocks. And they also beget sons and daughters. So how many generations are here now? Do you see in that verse? Yeah. Three generations. At least. Three generations. Adam and Eve still have not heard about the gospel. And this is right in your scriptures, right out of the temple. Let me just explain to you. The book of Moses was the narrative for the endowment from the time of Joseph Smith until there's been a few changes made, but the book of Moses is the narrative to that endowment, and some of you will remember parts of that. So Adam and Eve have three generations, and they still haven't heard the gospel. It's three generations before Adam gets the gospel. Um, and we read in verse 4 of Moses chapter 5, and it says, And Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord, and they heard the voice of the Lord from the way toward the Garden of Eden. And he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord, Lord their God and should offer, the fir- offer the firstlings of their flock. For an offering unto the Lord, and Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. And what happens when the angel comes? Why are you doing this? Yeah, Adam, the angel's questions, why are you doing this? So how many generations now, this Adam's still offering sacrifice, he's been obedient to that. He has, son, he has sons and daughters, and those sons and daughters begin to divide two and two, and they begin to have sons and daughters. So we've already got at least three generations. Adam's still offering sacrifice. He's still being obedient to the commandment to offer sacrifice. And it says, that, and seeking is what he's doing is he is seeking for further light and knowledge from, mess, from messengers from the presence of God as to why he is offering sacrifice. That's what he's doing. He's wondering why. And after many days, that's three generations, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Adam and says, why do you offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam says, I haven't got any idea. I don't know anything. I don't know about it. Three generations later, he's still looking for that information, that light and truth. And the angel says, why are you doing it? He says, I don't know. I have no idea. I've been looking for this information. He says, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I have no idea about the gospel. And then the angel spake unto him, said, this thing is in similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father. Now he's beginning to understand which is full of grace and truth. Wherefore thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. So he's explaining some things that he needs to do. He's, 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 he's introducing the gospel and the concept of Christ, that this is the way you need to leave, live. And in that day, verse 9 says, And in that day the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, and saying, I am the only begotten of the Father, from the beginning, henceforth, and forever, as thou hast fallen, Thou mayest be redeemed. So he begins explaining the gospel to Adam. Three generations after he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, he begins to get the gospel. Well, there's something interesting in our Pearl of Great Price. The Pearl of Great Price is the book that answers all the questions. When you actually get into the Pearl of Great Price, all seven major dispensations are represented in the Pearl of Great Price. The dispensation of Adam in chapter 5 four and five of of the book of Moses, the dispensation of Enoch in chapter uh, six and seven, the dispensation of Noah in chapter eight, uh, the dispensation of Abraham in the book of Abraham, the dispensation of Moses in chapter one through three of Moses, uh, the dispensation of the fullness of time in Matthew 24, the dispensation of the fullness of time, or the the dispensation of Joseph Smith in the Joseph Smith history. All seven major dispensations are represented in the Pearl of Great Price, and each, and there is a specific pattern called the apocalyptic pattern that shows up in each one of those dispensations within the text itself in the Pearl of Great Price. Pearl of Great Price is the book that answers all the questions. And there's an interesting thing that we see as we read these verses uh, 7, 8, and 9 in Moses chapter 5. And that interesting thing is, is that Enoch begins to quote from the book of Adam. In chapter 6, Enoch begins, 
specifically quoting from the book of Adam. And he provides the detail that fits between verses 8 and 9 of chapter 5. So you, have, you, you will read down through Moses chapter 8, or chapter 5, verse 8. Then you, should, oops, then you should go to Moses, or then you should go to Moses chapter 6, and then read verses 51 through 68, those 18 verses, 17 verses there. You read that, and then you go back to Moses chapter 5, verse 9, and you continue on. Because Enoch, in order to establish his Zion, takes the book of Adam and begins quoting from it to his people. And we see, and it even says there, and the Lord spake unto Adam, saying, and you could actually put quote marks there in verse 51. And you could put the last quote marks in verse 68 of chapter 6. He begins quoting from the book of Adam in order to supply that detail that we don't often see in, in chapter 5. Go ahead. Well, Adam kept a record, it says. Adam kept a record of all things. We learned in the Pearl of Great Price. He kept, he kept a book. There's been an apocalypse of Adam, a testament of Adam that's been discovered um, in the last number of years. Um, there's a lot more records out there than we would like to think. And one of them, uh, in the apocalypse of Adam uh, that's been discovered, uh, the Lord appears to Adam and he says, Adam, uh, you wanted to be a god, um, and I will make you a god, but not right now. He says, you have to live, and I have to be born of thee, and you will die, and I have to come through your lineage, basically. He says, I have to come through, thee, through you, and I will be uh, resurrected. And then he says, when, when that happens, I will, uh, you will be resurrected, and I will set you at the right hand of my di divinity, and you can become a god like you wanted to be. Um, so it's, uh, there's a lot of information out there. But anyway... That's from the book of Adam. Now, now I'm going to go to those verses there in chapter 6. And he called upon our father Adam by his own voice, saying, and you could actually put quote marks there, uh, I am God, I made the world, and men before they were in the flesh. And he also said unto him, If thou wilt turn unto me and hearken unto my voice, and believe and repent of all thy transgressions, and be baptized even in water, in the name of mine only begotten, who is full of grace, he is giving him the detail to the very beginning aspects of the gospel, speaking of baptism which is Jesus Christ, the only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come to the children of men. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, asking all things in his name, and whatsoever you ask, it shall be given you. So he's now introducing Christ in the gospel, Enoch supplying what the Lord said to Adam when he received that gospel. And our father Adam spake unto the Lord, Why is it that men must repent and be baptized? And the Lord said unto Adam, I have forgiven thy transgression in the Garden of Eden. You're already forgiven. It's already taken care of. And the Lord spake unto Adam, saying, Is as much as thy children are conce conceived in sin, meaning the sinful world, even so when they begin to grow up, sin conceiveth in their hearts. So because we live in a rotten world, we're kind of rotten sometimes, most of the times, according to uh, King Benjamin. Inasmuch as thy children are conceived in sin, even so when they begin to grow up, sin conceiveth in their hearts, and they taste the bitter, that they may know to prize the good. And it's given unto them to know good from evil, wherefore there are agents unto themselves. And I have given unto you another law and commandment. So he says, okay, this is what you have to do. This is what you need to do. Now I'm going to give you another commandment. Here's the first commandment after they get the gospel. After they're starting to get the gospel, I'm going to give you another commandment now. And he says, <clears throat> wherefore, <clears throat> teach it unto your children that all men everywhere must repent, or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God, for no unclean thing can dwell there, or dwell in his presence. Therefore I give unto you a commandment to teach these things freely unto your children. In two verses, he gives one commandment, emphasized in two verses. Verse 57, teach this unto your children. Teach it, that there's a Savior, that there's no original sin that you have to repent and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy. He says, teach that unto your children. And then he concludes that in verse, verse 58 by saying again, I give unto you a commandment to teach these things freely unto your children. That doesn't mean without charge. That means all the time. All the time. Teach these things. You've got to get this in them. What is it in section 68 of the Doctrine and Covenants? If parents have children in Zion and what? Teach them not to understand faith, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. The sin will be upon the heads of the parents. 
Now, to teach them, those who teach them not to understand implies that we as parents understand it. And that's the very first commandment Adam gets after he gets the, receives the gospel, is to teach these things under your children. Teach these things freely under your children, that which means all the time. Teach it all the time about the Savior and about the atonement and about redemption. And then it goes on in verse 59, we're going to skip a little bit, that by reason of transgression cometh the fall, and he's explaining a little, he's going on explaining a little more in depth, bringeth death, and inasmuch as you were born into the world by water, and the spirit which I have made also became the dust of a living soul, even so you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water and of the spirit, and be cleansed by blood, even the blood of mine only begotten, that you might be sanctified from all sin, and enjoy the words of eternal life, in this world and eternal life in the world to come. So he's explaining what the potentials are, what the opportunities are going to be. That's the gospel. What he said in those few verses is the gospel and our responsibility in the gospel to make sure that our children have it, to understand it, comprehend it, as section 68 says. Then in verse 60, he says, By the water you keep the commandment, by the spirit you are justified, and by the blood you are sanctified. There's three cleansings, there's three baptisms in the Book of Mormon. What, you remember what they are? Baptism of water, fire, and the Holy Ghost or the Spirit. It doesn't say or. It doesn't say by fire or the Holy Ghost. It says by fire and the Holy Ghost. There's three of them, not two of them. That's the three that is talked about in the Book of Mormon are explained here in verse 60. By the water, the baptism of water, by the water you keep the commandment. By the Spirit you are justified. And by the blood, i.e. the refiner's fire, you are sanctified. And many people will say, well, the spirit and fire in the, whole, in the Book of Mormon are the same thing. It's not the same thing. It always says, and, and this is the explanation of it. It's the refiner's fire. It's the sanctification. By the water you keep the commandment. By the spirit you are justified. By the blood you are sanctified. And then he says, <clears throat> verse 62, now behold, I say unto you, this is the plan of salvation unto all men through the blood of mine only begotten who shall come in the meridian of time. And it came to pass when the Lord had spoken with Adam our father, he cried unto the Lord and he was caught away by the spirit of the Lord and carried down into the water and was laid under the water and brought forth out of the water and he was baptized and the spirit of God descended upon him and thus he was born of the spirit. Now verse 65 here is included in verse 9 of Moses chapter 5. Are you seeing how this fits together? And 66, and he heard a voice out of heaven said, Thou art baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost. This is the record of the Father and the Son henceforth and forever. And thou art after the order of him who is without beginning of days or end of years from eternity to all eternity. And then he says, Behold, thou art one in me. That's the word for atonement. One in me. Thou art one in me, a son of God, and thus... By this way, by this gospel, by doing this, by participating in this gospel, by doing all of this, thus may all become my sons and daughters. That's why it says in John chapter 1, Christ came and gave us power to become the sons and daughters of God. And that's what he's saying here. This, it's the gospel, it's the plan of salvation that gives us power to become the sons of sons and daughters of God, as it says in John chapter 1. And this is what it says as it, as it ends this passage. This is the way we become sons and daughters unto God. Now back to verse 9, Moses chapter 5. In that day the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam. And so, so we've just seen the detail there in Moses chapter 6. Seen the detail. And then in 11, that's why that other one was there. 10 was out where Adam said, were it not, Adam says the same thing in verse 10, that somehow that slide got moved. Adam says in verse 10, if we hadn't have sinned, if we hadn't have transgressed, we would have never known anything about the redemption. And it says, and Eve, his wife, heard Adam say that, heard all of these things, and was glad. Now, <clears throat> when we think and teach that Eve understood the gospel before the fall, if you let Eve speak for herself, this is what she says, were it not for our transgression. If we hadn't have fallen, were it not for our transgression, we would have never had seed. There would have been no posterity. We wouldn't have even known anything about it. 
for they would have remained in a state of innocence. We would have never known if it were not for our transgression. We should have never known good and evil. Were it not for our transgression, we would not have ever known the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. That's Eve's words. Not the opinion and tradition that we're often taught or believe that Eve understood the gospel. She says she didn't. And she says, were it not for our transgression, just as, just as Adam did in verse 10, were it not for our transgression, we would have never known any of this stuff. Remembering that it's three generations later. You remember it used to say um, about Adam and Eve, even in the temple years ago, it used to say that, uh, in, in a manner of speaking, it said that um, he was having great success among all of these people except Adam and Eve. That's out of the next two or three verses. Remembering there's three generations. Well, here's that command again. Teach these things unto your children in Moses uh, chapter 6. And I give unto you commandment to teach these things freely unto your children. Now we're going back in verse 12 there, which is the next verse in chapter 5. And Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all these things known unto their sons and daughters. That's those three generations. Now that they got the gospel, they taught them. They made all of these things known unto their sons and daughters. That's those th three generations. And then Satan came among them. Joseph Smith said that Satan sets up his kingdom at the very same time that the Lord sets up his as soon as the gospel's on the earth, then Satan sets up his gospel kingdom or his gospel. As soon as they know about a son of God who's going to atone for the sins of mankind, Satan comes on the scene and says, I am also a son of God. Satan came among them saying, I am also a son of God. And he commanded them saying, believe it not. And they believed it not. And they loved Satan more than God. And men from that time forth became carnal, sensual, and devilish. So as soon as the gospel's given to them, as soon as they're taught the gospel, Satan's there saying, look, you can't see that God that your father's talking about. And Satan, we learn elsewhere, is up in the Book of Mormon, is appearing as an angel of light. And Satan is saying, I'm also a son of God. You can see me. You can't see the one he's talking about. Don't believe your father. And it says, and they believed it not, and they loved Satan more than God. Now men from that time forth, not before that, not before they had the gospel. Only after they get the gospel can they sin against the gospel. Only after they get it. Men from that time forth became carnal, sensual, and devilish. You have to have gospel law in order to sin against the gospel. You can't be disobedient until you covenant to be obedient. So Satan came among them saying, Believe it not, and they believed it not. And they loved Satan more than God, and men from that time forth became carnal, sensual, and devilish. So the gospel is taught to Adam and Eve after the fall. Well, who are the, the they in this verse? People will say, well, there was no death before the fall, and Adam and Eve could change. But there's a verse here, in, in uh, two verses actually, in 2 Nephi, speaking about all things which were created must have remained the same in which they were after they were created if Adam had partaken. Uh, if he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, must have remained forever and had no end. And this is the question. And they would have had no children, and they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. It's obvious that these two verses are talking specifically about Adam and Eve. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. Alma 12 says, puts it this way. He says, Now behold, if it were possible that our first parents could have gone forth and partaken of the tree of life, they would have been miserable forever, having no preparatory state, and thus the plan of redemption would have been frustrated, and the word of God would have been void, taking none effect. But it is not so. It was appointed unto man to die. Joseph Smith makes an interesting statement. He says, For it was not given unto Adam and Eve to partake of the fruit, but it was given unto them to die. And that's what it's saying here in verse 27. It was appointed unto men that they must die, and after death they must, they must come to judgment, even that same judgment of which we have spoken, which is the end. And after God had appointed these things should come unto man, after he's going to die, behold, he then saw that it was expedient that man should know concerning the things whereof he had appointed unto them. So after the, it's what he's saying, after the fall, they needed to know about the gospel. 
and what it was all about. Can you see that there? Okay, I see heads. Remember, you can ask any question you want. I told some the other day that the greatest line in Star Wars is the simple-minded are easily persuaded. <laughs> That's the best line in Star Wars. Go ahead. No, they would have never died. Even without the taking of the if, if they've never, if they had never, if they had never partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they'd live forever, having no joy, no misery. That's we just looked at that second Nephi. If they had partaken of the fruit, now, now think of what Satan's plan would be: get them to partake of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, which separates them now from God. What do you think Satan would want to do next in order to stop the plan? No? Yeah. Hey, there's some fast food down here on the corner that's really, really good, and that, we call that the tree of life. And they would have remained forever in their sins, and the plan of redemption would have been frustrated. So that's what Satan would, would and was probably his plan thinking to do that, but Satan knows not the mind of God. And the Lord placed a cherub, a, a, a cherubim and a flaming sword to guard the way of the tree of life so they couldn't partake of that. See, for Satan to do it, if he could get him to partake of one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and then the tree of life, it's messed up. Go ahead, there's another hand right there. So we learn why Adam partook of the fruit instead of the woman, so why did Eve partake of the fruit? Let the scripture speak for themselves. She says she, she was beguiled. She says, I was deceived. She says she was. Now, we can argue with that and say, well, she really didn't mean to say that. But that's what she says. She says, I saw that it was good for food. It was the, the, the serpent enticed me. Uh, you know, if you actually look at it, Eve recognizes the good things, the better, the finer things in life. She, she saw that it was good to look at. She saw that it, it tastes good. She saw that it would make her wise. I mean, that's just every, our relief society used to be organized that way. You know, you, you, you want something that looks good on the centerpiece, and it's going to make you wise. That's your education counselor, and you got your homemaking counselor. It's, uh, it tastes really good. You know, it's all those things. Why, why do you think there are 10 stores, maybe more than that, 10 to 15 stores in every mall for women than there are for men? Because they recognize the finer things, and that's what Eve says. I was beguiled. The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And we sometimes want to argue that fact, but that's what she says. And Paul says basically the same thing in the New Testament. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Not that that's wrong. There was a deception there. And Satan's trying. Who wouldn't want to have something good to eat? Has any, have you looked at two or three items when you go to dinner? Aren't you looking for something good to eat? You're here because you want to be wise. You know, it's the fight. Who, who's, who wouldn't fall? Who wouldn't go for that? And Eve recognized, I mean, saw those things. Go ahead. You had your hand up. So I was listening to a couple podcasts this last week, and it was talked about how Adam and Eve would have been taught in the Garden of Eden and educated, and that, you know, they would have known before they even came down to the Garden, like, the purpose of the earth and the plan. And the we, all, we all knew that before we came. Well, don't be confused. Use the scriptures. What they're, what, they're teach, what they're saying on that is not in scripture. That's why I say let the scriptures for the, speak for themselves. Eve says, were it not for our transgression, we would have never known anything about it. We would have never known anything about kids, and we would have never known anything about the gospel. And see, that's why I say there's people that will take these interpretations, opinions, uh, traditions and try and convince us that they are doctrinal. And when you do that, see, if that were the case, then there's two conflicting commandments. If that's not the case, then there isn't. We don't have to worry about that. Why you, Would a just God set you up to fail? No. No. 
That's what I say. There's a lot of things out there that are being taught that are not Scripture. Let the Scripture speak for themselves. Let Adam speak for himself. Let Eve speak for herself. And they just, they, they want these things to be, they wish these things were that way, and so they teach it that way. But that's just not right. How is it established that they could not have children prior to the fall? The, the Book of Mormon, they're in 2 Nephi. They would, have, they would have remained forever and had no seed. Because it's not in the Bible, that's one of the reasons where the confusion and a lot of the other faiths. It is, but we, we bring that confusion right back into us. Uh, Sister Thompson, or somebody, I think. Yeah, so. I think I heard you say that it was not appointed unto them that they should eat the fruit, but it was appointed unto them to die. Yeah, you heard me say that, but that was a quote from Joseph Smith. Okay, so I'm not understanding what that means. There might have been a different way for them to come to that conclusion. They could have, so they could have died in different ways. Right? Well, they might have chosen to partake of the fruit later on or to eat something else or I don't know, you know, I don't know what it might be, but the implication from Joseph by saying, for it was not appointed unto Adam and Eve to partake of the fruit, but it was appointed unto them to die, would indicate that there might have been another way. For that death to enter into the world, I don't, you know, I don't know what it would be, but Satan, Satan wanted control in the pre-earth life, and when he comes down here, he wants control too. He wants to set things in motion. He wants to control the gospel and the plan. And so, when question, he's when question about what he's doing, he says, "I'm only doing that which has been done, not which I have done, but which has been done in other worlds." What's that? Giving some of the fruit to them. Maybe in the other worlds, they just get tired of, uh, you know, apple pie, and they want some. A different flavor you know at, at a certain time but he's only doing that which has been done in other worlds not which he has done so that's what Joseph Smith said and that's kind of what Alma says too uh, it says it and, and uh, Lehi it was appointed unto man to die that's what was appointed so that all of the rest of us could come along go ahead That they can't partake of the fruit uh, of every tree thou mayest freely eat, but of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. Um, nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself, uh, for it is given unto thee. Um, but remember that I forbid it, for in the day that thou partakest thereof thou shalt surely die. But he says, nevertheless, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto you. There's going to be a price. There's a consequence. And so um, that just struck me just now. I'm just thinking, okay, they can still eat. I mean, they were told not to, but there would be a price or a penalty if they did. And yeah. then that's when they... And that's why Eve, Adam partakes of the fruit, because Eve, Eve, Eve did. Right. And the woman thou gavest me and commanded that she should remain. So he chose yeah. to fall to remain with Eve. Eve was deceived, and that's what Paul says, but the man was not deceived, is what Paul says. Eve was beguiled, in her words. Adam partook to remain with Eve. Yeah, he was ready just to stick to... The I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, yeah. yeah. No chance, no chance. But that, that kind of gives no difference between good and evil. Right. right. Yeah, all she was doing is, you know... Don't eat this one, but you can go ahead if you want to because you have the agency to do it. If you want to, go right ahead. But remember, there's going to be a consequence. This is the way that obedience is taught in the scriptures. We have this, I think, in the temple because obedience, there's a certain pattern to obedience or learning obedience, and that is you have to be able, you have to be old enough to be able to use your agency. You have to be able to comprehend what the, what the choices are. You have to comprehend the choices and you have to comprehend the consequence at the same time. And if there's no consequence, then there's no sin, says, says Alma. If there's no consequence, then there's no sin. If there's no sin, there's no remorse. If there's no remorse, there's no law. And so we, 
there's certain things that have to be there. We have to be able, old enough, to understand what the law is, old enough and free enough to make the choice and be able to comprehend what the consequence is going to be. And that's how God teaches obedience in the scriptures. Over and over again. There's a hand in the very back there. Yes. He them. Yeah. Here's what the consequences are going to be. Yeah. In other words, if you want to stay here, then don't do it. If you want to stay in this lifestyle, and all of us have a Garden of Eden. That's what you do with your kids. You te teach your kids the exact same way that the Lord instructs Adam and Eve. You have laws and there's consequences. They have to be able to understand the law. They have to be able to have the free agency to make a choice, right? Whatever choices there are. And they have to understand those consequences the same way. And if they want to remain in your Garden of Eden, then they have to go through. You know, it's what we end up doing is saying, wait till your dad gets home, you know. <laughs> God didn't tell Adam and Eve, okay, you got one more chance. No, he follows through. If, he didn't say if you got one more chance. What he was doing is forewarning with the consequence. The consequence is there. And they have to understand that consequence. Well, going on. Now, I want to go back to this, this Alma 12. It says, After God had appointed these things should come unto him, behold, he saw that it was expedient that man should know concerning these things. So, he sent angels to converse with them. See, this is the angels that come to Adam. It's, they're called the three sent ones in, most, um, in Jewish mythology or Jewish tradition. He sent angels to converse with them who caused men to behold his glory. And they began from that time forth to call upon his name. Therefore, God conversed with men and made known unto them the plan of redemption, which had been pre prepared from the foundation of the world and made known unto them according to their faith and repentance and their holy works. In Alma 12, it goes on, Wherefore he gave commandments unto men, uh, they having first transgressed the first commandments as to the things which were temporal, becoming gods, knowing good from evil. We often, I often, I used to wonder, why is it that knowing good from evil is a bad thing? And this is why it says that after they got the gospel, that from that time forth, men became carnal, sensual, and devilish. Because we are such that once we know good and evil, we have a nature and a disposition that's going to be evil. The natural man is an enemy to God and always will be. We can't help it. We are fallen. We can't help it. We have desires, appetites, and passions. And knowing good and evil now places us in a position for consequences. And that consequence was to, be, was to fall. Um, knowing good from evil, placing themselves in a state to act, or being placed in a state to act according to their wills and pleasures, whether to do good, do good or evil. Therefore God gave unto them commandments, after having made known unto them the plan of salvation. So the real gospel comes after they understand it. The commandments are there, after having made known unto them the plan of salvation. We see it in DNC 49. But I, behold, I say unto you that the, I, the Lord God, gave unto Adam and his seed. And remember, he had three generations. I gave unto Adam and his seed that they should not die as to the temporal death until I, the Lord God, should send forth angels to declare unto them faith and repentance. Okay? Those are the three sent ones. They come, the angels come to teach Adam and that posterity, those three generations. And they, there was no death in the world until all of that family, those generations get the gospel. No human death. No human death. Yeah. And that's what Second Nephi is talking about there. And thus we read in Moses 5.58, And thus the gospel began to be preached from the beginning, being declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God. Alma 12, 29, therefore he sent angels to converse with them who caused men to be hold of his glory. These are the angels who come. Adam was seeking for further light and knowledge and those angels came to, the, to Adam to teach that gospel. They're called the three sent ones in Jewish tradition. There's always three sent ones. The three that come to Abraham 
in the wilderness uh, uh, or out in the desert, the three that come there, uh, in the um, Mandean literature, in the Book of Adam, in the Mandean literature that was discovered, Lady Drower translates that um, in the Book of Adam that um, God sent the three pillars of the church to teach Adam the gospel. And the three pillars of the church are later defined or identified in that same text as Peter, James, and John who come to Adam to teach him the gospel. And there's a reason that it's Peter, James, and John. And that is, we see this in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is really an unusual section because it's a reverse line of authority. This is the only place in Scripture that it has a reverse line of authority. And it says, I'm going to go through it quickly. In verse 5, Behold his wisdom in me, in me, wherefore marvel not, for the hour cometh that I will drink the fruit of the vine with you on earth. With Moroni. When did Moroni live? 400 A.D. 400 A.D. Whom I have sent. And going on down to verse 7, And also with John, the son of Zacharias. When did he live? 30 AD. 30 AD. Now notice we're going back in time. 400 AD, now we're down to 30 AD. And just to make things quick in verse 9, and also Elijah. When did Elijah live? About that, 8 to 900 BC. That's good. And then verse 10, and notice how it's worded here. And also with Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. Notice the reverse order. Notice it's never that way anywhere else in Scripture. It's always Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in this, we're going in a reverse line of authority. And also with Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, and by your fathers by whom the promises were made, and also with Michael or Adam. So now where are we back? Now we're gone back. And then there's one more step. And also with Peter, James, and John. The presidency, the presidency of the Melchizedek priesthood. Christ doesn't have priesthood. Okay. What we call the Melchizedek priesthood is the holy order after the order of the Son of God. He has power. It's inherent. It's there. And the priesthood is what Peter, James, and John have, as well as uh, many of us, but that Peter, James, and John are the presidency of that priest. When that priesthood is conveyed or those keys are given, it is under the authority of Peter, James, and John, that presidency. That's why this reverse line of authority. They are the ones who have to give it to Adam. They are the ones in charge of the administration of the gospel throughout the history of the world. Well, Moses 5, he made not all things known unto their sons and daughters, and Satan came among them, saying, I am also a son of God. And he commanded them, saying, Believe it not, and they believed it not. And men from that time became, uh, henceforth became carnal, sensual, and devilish. The totality of civil and religious future of humanity, all of world history, all current events are summed up in the words of God that initiate the gospel of Jesus Christ as the burden of the fall is placed upon the world. And I want to talk a little bit about this just for a second. Well, let's look at this. There's one verse in the Genesis epic that sets the standard and the pattern for everything that takes place from the fall till the end of time. And that's this one verse. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Saying that all of the world, all of everything that happens, all of world history, all of current events, all the political situations, all the wars and perplexities of nation, everything is nothing more, nothing more than the details between the battle that rages between the establishment of Zion, God's kingdom on earth, and the establishment of Babylon. Everything, everything, everything is nothing more than the details of that battle that's going on. All of world history. So that's a prophecy then, right? It is. The seed of the woman is prophesying of Christ. And the serpent represents Satan here. All of world history. This is the introduction. This is the first mention of the gospel after the creation. This is when the fall takes place. Adam and Eve's wife ceased not to call upon God. And Eve, see now there's three generations. Adam and Eve have the gospel. And they ceased not to call upon God. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man-child from the Lord, wherefore he will not reject the gospel. Cain is the first one born after they get 
the gospel. And she says, now we have a patriarch. He's going to go to primary. He's going to go to young men's. He's going to go to priesthood. He's going to go to seminary. He's going to go to institute. But the problem was they sent him to scouts. <laughs> so they have three generations and they all rejected the gospel except for Adam and Eve. Satan had great success among all of those posterity of Adam except for Adam and Eve. And now that they have the gospel, Adam knows his, knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bare a son and says, now I have gotten a man child from the Lord and he's not going to reject it like everybody else because I'll teach him from the very beginning. Okay, any questions? But Cain hearkened not saying, who is the Lord that I should know him is the next part of that verse. And that will be the next session. I don't know what time it is. Oh, we still got an hour. What's that? Yeah, we want to take a break. Is that all right? Any questions about this before? Remember, you're not required to come back, but the best part is yet to come.